Let's venture into the world of enzymes. You've heard of enzymes before. You probably know that you have some in your mouth called salivary amylase. A lot of these little molecules like this that are binding to starch when you're eating and then breaking it down into glucose and maltose for digestion so you can actually get some energy from it. So uh, let's fly through. Taking a look, I want to show you one thing. There is a, a gene in the DNA, in our DNA, that codes for a protein called PAH, which is phenylalanine hydroxylase. And uh, what it does is it normally breaks down phenylalanine into another amino acid called tyrosine. Anyways, this is a mutation, and it's a mutation in a gene, and as a result, that creates a damaged enzyme. It doesn't actually prevent us from living. We can still live, but unfortunately, this enzyme, which is supposed to actually break down phenylalanine into tyrosine, actually builds up and starts poisoning cells, and it results in a disease called PKU. I'm not going to read this entire thing, but um, if you have this disease, and by the way, it's a disease that you get only if you've inherited uh, this trait from both your parents. It's a homozygous recessive disease. And so it shows you the significance of how genetics is, and how it actually, why you want your genes to be not broken because it can result in various types of genetic uh, disorders and this is one such thing. So it turns out if you end up with this disease, um, as long as it's taken care of while you're developing and even while you're older, you should be okay. You can take tyrosine supplements, which is what phenylalanine gets converted to. And you have to watch out to make sure that this phenylalanine doesn't get uh, built up too much. And so you need to avoid certain types of foods that are high in phenylalanine, or at least keep them under control. Uh, meat products, fish products, dairy, wheat, eggs. It's a lot of good stuff here, uh, including diet soda, which actually contains this uh, artificial sweetener called aspartame, which is actually similar in structure to phenylalanine, which is not good. So, um, yeah. It's all because this one enzyme isn't doing its job because its shape is slightly wrong. Now, for this first video, we're just going to be looking at the basics. Um, but for the higher level videos, you're going to start to understand specifically how the shape of an enzyme is really, really important. So an enzyme is basically a substance, you can call it a catalyst if you want, that helps to speed up chemical reactions. And how does it speed up chemical reactions? It reduces the amount of energy required for a reaction to happen. So normally a reaction will happen if you give it enough time, but enzymes help to make it uh, a lot faster and more efficient. And if for humans, that's very good for living efficient lives. So imagine here you have some beans that are jumping. These are jumping beans, and they can't get to this area over here because this barrier is a little bit too high. So what an enzyme basically does is it actually comes in and it reduces, it lowers this barrier and then so now these little beans can jump to this side. So just an analogy showing you that to get from the products of a, of a chemical reaction, uh, sorry, to get from the reactants to the products, you have to overcome a certain barrier of, of energy and enzymes help to lower the energy requirements. So in the end, you get more of the reaction happening in a shorter amount of time, basically. So that's called the activation energy. That's all you really need to understand at this level here, but uh, later we're gonna jump into this in more detail. So a fancy way to call that energy required is called the EA, or the activation energy. So an enzyme actually, enzymes actually reduce the activation energy. Um, there are various different ways that we try to explain how enzymes work, and the most famous is called the lock and key hypothesis. There's another called the induced fit hypothesis, but that'll come in a later video. The idea here is that an enzyme, an enzyme has a, a particular area here. I never get clear which one is supposed to be the lock and which one is supposed to be the key. Obviously, this one looks like a key. This one looks like a lock. But the point is, is that the enzyme, this active site right here will only bind to one specific substrate or it's only supposed to bind to one specific substrate. So if this was actually amylase in our mouth, it would only be looking for starch. And something else like a fat or a lipid would not actually be able to bind to it because its shape does not fit this particular active site. Now when you learn about exactly what an enzyme is, in three-dimensional detail, this will make a lot more sense, but using these little blobs right here is a pretty good way to represent uh, the idea here. So the enzyme has an active site, which is a specific shape that will fit a specific substrate. 
which means that these enzymes are specific. And once it binds, then it lowers the activation energy and this helps to make the chemical reaction actually happen. In this case, it's to break down one thing into two things over here. That's called a lock and key hypothesis. So they are specific back into our saliva. We talked about salivary amylase, uh, the substrate. The substrate is what it is meant to bind to. So salivary amylase is meant to bind to starch and the product, what is it broken down to? It's broken down to maltose. One maltose molecule is actually made up of two glucose molecules combined. So maltose can then be broken down further into glucose if we need that to be the case. So the enzymes can actually help to combine things together as well too. So here you have substrate 1, substrate 2 forming a temporary enzyme substrate complex and it's lowered the activation energy and there's the product. So in this case the enzyme's goal is to join two things together. Factors such as temperature and pH, we're going to see this in the next video, can affect enzyme activity and we can make predictions with the graph showing how things like that might change. Um, so I'm not going to get into that too much right here, but it turns out that slivery amylase, as well as all the other enzymes in this beautiful body right here, work best at around human body temperature, 37 degrees. And we're going to see if it goes too high, you can really mess with the shape of the enzyme. If it goes too low, the enzyme might not work because there's not enough energy to allow the enzymes to bump into other molecules that are around there. So enzymes are specific and they function under pretty specific conditions as well too. So here's an example of two digestive enzymes. Pepsin is found, well you can kind of guess. I don't know how accurate this, this graph is, but anyways, it's, uh, it's a free picture. So here, here we go. If you take a look at this, look at this graph, it seems that pepsin works best rate of reaction at around a pH of 3 and trypsin seems to work best at around a pH between 6 and 7. So you can use this kind of data analysis to help you figure out where these enzymes might function best in the body. Pepsin, I might guess, is somewhere where it's relatively acidic in my dig digestive system like the stomach. Trypsin, maybe closer to neutral or slightly, slightly alkaline. Uh, there are some others pancreatic amylase. Anyways, that might be something that might be in the small intestines or something like that. So they do work at an optimum pH. Again, at the higher level, we'll explore why changing the pH can actually mess with the enzymes. It actually ends up changing the shape. And uh, if the shape is very specific like this and you change the shape of the active site, then guess what? It can't fit anymore based on the lock and key hypothesis. Okay? So that's the basic introduction to enzymes. Next video, we're going to look at really quickly the factors that can affect enzyme reactions. And it's a great place to start when designing your own experiments. All right.